Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Y'all can be seated. Oh, everybody's seated. Praise God. Praise God. I looked up and seen you. You didn't wait for pastor this time. Praise the Lord. How many are glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Me too. Glad to see Glad to see you here. Had a few folks. I was telling Ernesto text and say, uh, are you having church? It's raining. Yeah, we're having church. Praise God. We, I believe in having church. You know, I'm going to say something. The Bible says as we get closer to the last days, we ought to gather more. It says that. Why? Because we're going to need each other. Amen? Uh, so... How many, how many either were in or saw Sunday night service? You got to have your britches on. Okay. Well, I'm going to do a quick recap because we're going to talk about you got to have, do you have your britches on part two? So we're going to, we're asking the question again. Do you have your britches on? Hey, Jesse, good to see you. So Sunday night, we begin to talk about how God doesn't look on the outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. And how God is searching to uh, all over the earth to, to see who he can show himself strong to. And the person that he shows himself strong to is a person whose heart is perfect or pure towards the Lord. And we saw that, we saw that um, David wrote in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, he wrote, God is merciful to those that have mercy. God is just to those that have are just. God, God is pure to those that ha- have purity. And so, and God is, it says that God wrestles with those that ain't. <laughs> and so, I just want I just want to talk to you tonight for a little while. We're going to continue the subject matter on do you have your 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 britches on. So we got to Exodus 28, and I'm going to give y'all a homework assignment. I think you should all read all of Exodus 28, because I'm going to touch on pieces of it tonight, but I'm not going to be able to uh, touch on all of it. So uh, I am going to talk about the outer garments a little while tonight, because it's going to be important to understand why God was telling them to have their underwear on. But God said, make linen underwear and wear them. Because what he's saying is, hey, he, he told him about the outer garments first. And he says, he, he's basically telling them, hey, what you look like on the outside is important. But what you look like when nobody sees you or nobody, nothing, what, what you're wearing or what you look like on the inside that nobody can see is more important than what people can see. The you that no one knows about. The you I only know about. That's what's just as important. If not more, it's more important than what's on the outside. And so I want to I wanna talk tonight uh, from that standpoint. But before I get back into the scripture that we read in Exodus 28, I first want to open in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I'm going to read this and pray, and we're going to get going. Father, I thank you for the anointing. I come against any distraction or anything in the spirit that would hinder the service. Father, I I just thank you now. Oh, yeah, there it is. I thank you for the anointing, Father, and I thank you, Father, that the, the enemy cannot disrupt this service in the name of Jesus, and I thank you, Father, that any demonic assignment or principality that would try man that's what the lord said that would try to come against this house i thank you father that it can't do it and i speak life and peace over your people father i decrease that you might increase i thank you father that you speak through me i can't speak this word unless you help me speak it lord help me teach tonight exactly what you want your people to learn in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. First Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 9. And I'm using this. It's foundational for this message. I want us to really see this. I'm not going to preach too much of it. The word preaches for itself. 
And so, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That word peculiar is pretty peculiar when you look it up. It it means that God has ownership over you. It means you stand out. It means you're not like anything else on the planet. Amen? You, do you know, Jesse, you're not supposed to be like anyone else at school. You're supposed to be like who God's created you to be. You, because you're a peculiar person. You ain't supposed to fit in. You're supposed to stand out. Alex, you're supposed to stand out. Any, any dead fish can swim downstream. Don't, don't, don't drift with the fish. Swim up current. Dare to be different because you have accepted Jesus and you got Jesus down on the inside of you. Stand out, son, because you're called to. You're not called to look like everybody else. You're not called to run with everybody else. You're not called to go do what everybody else is doing. You're supposed to set a higher standard. You're not supposed to act and behave like everybody else. There's greatness down on the inside of you, and God is telling you right now that he's drawing it out of you. He's drawing it out of you. You're, you're, you're men of God. You're peculiar people. You stand out. You're God's glory. You're peculiar people that you should for, show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Let's read it one more time. But you were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So many people get called out of darkness, man, and into his marvelous light, and then they're still longing for the darkness. They're they trying to get back to the darkness every chance they get. And I came to tell you tonight, dare to stay in the light. Dare to be different. Dare to say, no, you can go do what you want, but I'm going on with the Lord, and I'm going to show forth His praise. Everything I do is going to magnify the Lord. Everything I say, every, every way I act, everything I wear, everything that I am is going to magnify the Lord. You're called to show forth His praise. You're called to magnify Him. You're called to stand out. You're called to be different. You're chosen. You're a royal priesthood. Glory to God. This is just foundation. I want you to see that he says that you're a royal priesthood. You both have royalty and you're a priest. Back in the Old Testament, you weren't just you were you weren't a, a, a king and a priest. You was a king. You were, there was an anointing to be king. There was an anointing to be prophet, and there was anointing to be priest. But you didn't see a a king and a priest. Rolled up in one. David came close. David, David came close to being a king, a priest, and a prophet because he prophesied when he sang the Psalms. And you know, doesn't the Bible say he went into the temple and ate of the showbread that was only for the priest to eat? But he was a type and shadow of Christ. But predominantly, when you look in the Old Testament, you saw. The anointing was on a priest to be a priest. He didn't flow in prophecy. The anointing was on a king to be the king. And the anointing was on the prophet to be the prophet. But this right here, it says that we're royal priests. And I want, you, I want to show you something. Okay, before I get into the underwear tonight, because we're going to talk about, do you got your underwear on? Do you got your britches on? Praise the Lord. But before I get into that, we're going we're gonna to back up a little bit. So like I said, I think everybody ought to read Exodus 28. And I'm not reading all of it tonight uh, because it is lengthy. But I am going to read, I think I'm going to read verses 1 down to verse 15. Exodus 28. And then I'm going to teach off of that. Uh, Judah, have your little... Uh, thing ready here Exodus 28 uh, verses 1 through 15 
And take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. Even Aaron, Nadab, and Adu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate and an ephod. I'm going to show you what an ephod is. And a robe and a broidered coat a mitar and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, and they shall make the ephod of gold and of blue and of purple and of scarlet. We're going to get into this in a minute. Do you know all these colors represent Jesus? And they represent you and I? They shall make an, the ephod of gold and of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine twine linen with cunning work or with skilled work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold and of blue and of purple and scarlet. And fine twine linen. Mm. And thou shalt take two oxen stones and grave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on one stone, and six other uh, names of the rest of the uh, on the other stone according to their birth, which is the work of the engraver in stone, like the engraving of the signet. Thou shalt engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, thou shalt make them to be set on the anches of gold, and it's on the shoulders. I'm going to show you in this it, when they put it up. You don't need to put it up yet, but we're about to get into it. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod from uh, stones of memorial unto children of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial, and thou shalt make anches of gold, and the, the two chains of pure gold at the end of wreathen work shall thou make them, and fasten the, the wreathen chains to the anches, and thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. Man, thank you, Lord. Let me get through it. Cunning work, after the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twine linen, thou shalt make it. Okay. Uh, can we put the picture up? So these are the outer garments of the priest. Okay. So this is what we just read. This is pretty cool. So I wish I had a laser pointer. So I'm just going to have to come and, and show you all. See this, see this thing right here that looks like uh, an apron over top, of the, over top of the blue? That's the ephod. And then the thing with all the stones in it, that's the breastplate of judgment. And then we see the gold that's attached to the breastplate that's holding it together. And then there's gold anches uh, holding the ephod together underneath his arms. You can see that. And then... Uh, something I didn't read, but I'm going to talk about it. See down here at the bottom of the blue, you see gold and you see something red looking. That's bells and pomegranates made out of gold. So I'm going to get into a bunch right now. So this is the outer garments of the priest. Do you know, I want to, I want to go in, each one of these means something, and I'm going to talk about it. The blue, the purple, the gold, the scarlet. We see all of these. We see the blue, the purple, and the gold. Y'all see that? All, all in this painting. So first I want to talk about what gold means. 
Gold represents God's divinity or his divine nature. It also represents value. It re represents wealth. It represents worth. And it represents purity. So a priest was to, to, man, listen to me now. What did Jesus say? Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will be on us and in us. The, the, the priest was supposed to wear divinity. He had the gold. He was supposed to wear purity. He, he walked like he was worth something to God. He didn't walk around saying, oh, I'm not worth anything. I'm not worth what God did for me. I'm not worth it. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. No, he walked in the sense that he knew he was worthy. He walked in the sense that he knew that he got God's divinity. He walked in the sense that he knew he had to stay pure before the Lord. He walked in, in purity. Now, the blue, I love this, the blue speaks of heaven. The blue reminds us of heaven. In other words, we're not supposed to be uh, paying attention or have our eyes set on earthly things. We're supposed to have our eyes set on heavenly things. The blue represents heaven. And, uh, and, and it, I'm going to get into that in a minute. The purple represents royalty, but it also I got to get into the scarlet before I could tell you what all purple represents. Uh, right now, I'm just going to say it represents royalty. Didn't I just read to you, you're a royal priest? Praise the Lord. But we're going to get deeper into this. I'm going to get deep into this. The scarlet represents blood, death, sacrifice, and manhood. So when you mix the blue, which speaks of heaven, and you mix, man, and you mix the scarlet, which speaks of uh, blood, death, sacrifice, and manhood, you get purple. Jesus came from heaven, but he walked as a man. Jesus thought it not robbery to be like God, but he took on the form of a servant. He was both God and man. The priests are representing who Jesus, the high priest, will once be, one time be, when he comes. So purple represents royalty, but it also represents the duality of Christ being both God and man. Praise the Lord. Now, I want to get, can we go deeper? So, when they go into the Holy of Holies, what they're saying is, I'm staying in Christ's stead until He comes. But they had to be pure and holy. Now, the pomegranate that is in between the bells you had a bell, then a pomegranate, then a bell, then a pomegranate, then a bell, and a pomegranate. The pomegranate represents two things. Man, Lord, help me preach this message tonight. Thank you, Lord. It represents being sanctified. It represents, it represents abundance and fertility. It represents holiness. That, that's one thing that the pomegranate represents. But another thing that it represents is God's Word. It said that there's 600... Have, how many have ever ate a pomegranate? So when you cut a pomegranate open, it trips you out. The first time I ever ate one, it, it looks like a fruit, right? And when you cut it open, it's full of seeds. And you actually eat the seed. And it said that there's 613 seeds... In the pomegranate, the 613 seeds in the pomegranate represent the 613 commandments God gave the children of Israel. In other words, each seed represents something in God's Word. So the pomegranate represents God's Word. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's 613 commandments, and he's saying 279 go towards the temple, like how you conduct yourself in the temple. That says a lot right there. So let me back up. So the priest had to wear gold, which represented God's divinity, but it also represented purity. He had to stay pure before the Lord. He had, a rep he had to wear blue, which means his eyes were not fixed on earthly things, but his eyes were fixed on heavenly things. He had to represent 
purple. Uh, he had to wear purple, which represented royalty, and it represented Christ. And then he had to wear scarlet that represented blood, it represented death, it represented sacrifice and manhood. So then he wore the pomegranate, which represented the word and represented sanctification. You can't be sanctified. You can't, you can't go in the holy of holies without being sanctified. And it speaks of the word, be washed by the water of the word. It speaks of the word sanctifying us and making us holy. You know, today... Today, uh, after I preached in the, in the uh, village on the park, the, the old women there, they started just asking me questions. I stayed like an extra hour answering questions. And one of the questions was, how can I have more faith? I don't have enough faith. And I'm like, no, you're asking the wrong question. See, faith, God's given to every man a measure of faith. And see, you have to develop that faith. And the way you develop that faith is by your knowledge in the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so, in other words, you get the Word of God in you. Well, the same principle that I just taught you about faith is true with holiness. The more I get God's divine holy Word inside of me, and it washes me and changes me and transforms me, be not conformed to the image of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I get in the Word of God, and I renew myself. I I transform myself by God's word. So you, if you want to walk out sanctification, you do it by the word of God through the spirit. As you stand on the word and say, no, the word says I shouldn't do this, so I'm not going to do it. And the Holy Spirit gives you strength not to do it. I'm going to tell you something I found out. I know he that knows to do good and does it not to him is, is a sin. But when something comes up, you're like, oh, well, I know I shouldn't do that, but I feel this pull. And the Spirit's like, no, you shouldn't walk in faith this way, and I'll give you the grace to overcome it. And you know what? When you resist the devil, he will flee from you. He'll be coming at you and coming at you and coming at you, but the more you stand on the Word and the more you say, no, I'm not following you, I'm following Christ, and I got the Word of God, and I'm going to walk out my life with God, and I'm going to sanctify myself, I'm going to set myself apart from the things of this world and the things you're trying to get me to do, I'm going to do what He wants me to do. And when you do that, you, 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 you operate in God's holiness. I'm going to say something. I can't stand this new age Christian teaching that says you just need the Spirit and you don't need the Word. No, the Spirit and the Word work together. And anybody that tells you you don't need the Word, they ain't reading the book. They're, they're, they're living some kind of new age spiritual life. And I'm telling you, the Word of God is foundational in the Christian's life. Notice he had the, the, the word, man, listen to this, wrapped around 360 degrees around his walk. Around his walk. The next thing that he had was bells. It was bells and pomegranates. The bells represented two things. They spoke of holiness, because again, you got to be holy when you go into the presence of God. And the bells did something. When they walked into the Holy of Holies, and if they had sin in their life that they didn't deal with, they dropped dead. God would not let them stay in His presence. They dropped dead. And you know how the people knew they dropped dead? Because them bells stopped ringing. Because when they walked, the bells would ring. And when the bells stopped ringing, they said, oh, somebody wasn't, wasn't walking the way they were supposed to walk. And you know, they couldn't go in and get them themselves. They had to get a hook to get in there and hook them and pull them out. Yes, they, 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 they had some fall protection on. <laughs> what, what are we, a lifeline when you go into a tank? Yeah, <laughs> praise the Lord. Uh, but the bells also represented something else. As soon as, as, soon as the, the high priest showed up, everyone knew he was there because he was making noise. When he got walked in the temple, there was a ringing, ringing, ringing. And he was making a lot of noise. You know what? When you come into the house of God, you're supposed to be making some noise. You're supposed to be shouting. You're supposed to be praising. You're supposed to be glorifying God. 
Notice he had, he had, he had the word. He had purity. He had holiness. He had, he had praise wrapped around his walk. There's people, man, I'm just going to preach. I don't care if y'all like it or not, but there's people coming to church nowadays, they sitting here like this, and they act like they ain't got something to praise. Well, you know what? He saved you. He changed you. He redeemed you. He set you free. He bought you with the price of his blood. I don't see nobody else shedding their blood for you. He shed his blood for you. He washed you. He sanctified you. He set you aside from from darkness and from sin and from evil for his holy purposes. And you can't praise him? You can't glorify, well, the music's too high. Or, well, we don't have a band. Or, well, you know what? I got, I, got, I got praise in my heart. I don't need no band. I don't need nobody to sing with me. I don't need nobody to shout with me. I'm going a, I'm to a praise him by myself if you ain't going to praise him. But I just came to tell you something. You know what? You, are, you, you was, was bankrupt in the spirit. God set you free. You might ought to praise him a little bit and thank him. I'm going to tell you something, man. Here we go. When he healed the ten lepers, all ten took off. He, it said, he said he cleansed them. So in other words, they didn't have leprosy no more. But the effects of leprosy were still there, the way I read it. So in other words, leprosy eats fingers, and it eats into your skin, and goes down to the bone, and it does all this stuff. Like it, it eats away at you until you die. He cleansed the leprosy. The leprosy was gone. And all ten got cleansed. And so they, they took off. He sent them away. And one was like, you know what? I just got cleansed of leprosy. I just got leprosy. Leprosy represented sin. How sin eats away at us. And he said, I just got cleansed. And you know what he did? He went and he dropped at the feet of Jesus. And he began to praise him because he got cleansed. And you know what Jesus did? He said, because you're praising me. Because you realize what I've done for you. Because you realize how I touched you. Because you realize that you wouldn't be nothing now without me. I am going to make you whole. In other words, I'm not just going to cleanse you. I'm not just going to forgive you of your sins. But everything sin destroyed in your life. Everything sin took away from you. I'm going to make you whole. I'm going to bring it back around into your life. You You might have lost family because of sin. You might have lost your relationship with your kids because of sin. You might have, or addiction. You might have lost, you know, your mother and your father's relationship. But I'm going to restore what the ringworm, the palmer worm, and the canker worm have eaten. I'm going to bring this back around and make you whole. Glory to God. And then people... (laughs) I ain't trying to harp on it. But we shouldn't have to say all the voices. It just ought to be all the voices. Well, I don't want nobody, I don't want nobody hearing me. I, I, I'm told I, I, I can't carry a tune in a bucket. You know what? I'm going to tell you something, and I mean it. I know God isn't tone deaf, but when it comes to the posture of your heart, God's tone deaf. God don't, God don't care what you sound like. God cares that it's your heart's posture towards Him. So they, I want you to see something too. God's divine nature and purity held it all together. The gold. Now, I'm going to get a little deeper with this. You see the stones on His, on his, on his shoulders? On this side, he had six names. It was the six, six tribes of Israel. Man, I'm going somewhere. And then on this side, he has six names. It was the other six tribes of Israel. And it was on his shoulders. You know what that represents? It represents interceding for the people. And I'm going to say something. There's, 
There's a lot of people that call themselves shepherds and a lot of people that call themselves pastors. And I'll just say this, a lot of people that call themselves saints, but they ain't got no intercession in them no more. They don't pray for nobody. They just, they just don't care. But the man of God was supposed to intercede for the people. He carried them upon his shoulders. <laughs> and then he had them on his breastplate. In other words, the same names. Look, there's 12 stones on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. He had the, he had, they represented the 12 tribes of Israel. He had them next to his heart. In other words, that was his, that was his, his desire was to be for God and for the people. Amen? So, he's dressed in royal garments. He, He's got things on him representing his duty as an intercessor and his duty to be in the word and to fulfill the word and his duty to praise and his duty to be holy for I am holy. You know what that speaks to me today? It speaks to me about our fruit. Jesus said we're called to bear fruit. Do you know, I'm, I, we're going to go somewhere for a minute. Do you know Jesus, when he walked up and he saw the fig tree, and he was like, oh, wow, the fig tree has got leaves. Well, it wasn't the right time of year for the fig tree to have leaves or fruit. But when a fig tree had leaves, it meant that it had fruit. In other words, it was advertising itself. Man, I, I hope you, it, was, it was putting itself out there. I got some figs. I got some fruit. And so Jesus said, oh, man, we got, a, we got a tree that's got some figs on it. And he was excited about it. And so he went to go and check it out, and it didn't have no figs. In other words, the fig tree was, was having some false advertising. It, it, it looked like it had fruit. It looked, it looked like it was a Christian. It looked like it was a leader. It looked like it was a priest. It looked like it was, it looked like it was walking out the things of God, but it didn't have no fruit. And you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees? He said, outwardly, you look like you got it going on. You got every piece and every, everything right fit where it's supposed to be, but inwardly, you're full of dead men's bones. Outwardly, you look like you're bearing fruit. Outwardly, when you walk down the street, folks get out your way, and they pay you respect, and they look at you as a leader, and they, 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 they speak highly of you, and they, they look on you like you're doing something. But inwardly, you're full of dead men's bones. In other words, outwardly you got it together. Inwardly you don't got it together. Inwardly you got secret sin. Inwardly you got pride. Inwardly you're not showing mercy. Inwardly you're not, you're not showing purity. You're not being pure. It's one thing to look like that, but it's another thing to walk like that. It's one thing... It's one thing to look like that. It's another thing to, to walk like that. And I'm going to tell you something. Just as it's a representation of Jesus, Jesus, everything, there's more stuff on there. I don't have time to explain all of it. But Jesus, the things I did explain, Jesus walked out every bit of that. He was an intercessor. He was a man of the word. He was a man of holiness. He was a man, of, he was a man that kept his eyes on the things of heaven. He said, I don't do anything I don't see the Father do. I don't say anything I don't hear the Father say. He, all of it he met. Now, we're a royal priesthood. We're, we are clothed with the Spirit of God. And we're supposed to walk in God's divine nature. I, I read to you the other day, as we stand on the promises of God, we're partakers of His divine nature. We're to walk out His divine nature on earth. There's a lot, I've heard people say this, well, that was Jesus. That ain't me. Ain't nobody can be like Jesus. That ain't what I see in the Bible. I see that we're that he's the firstborn of many brethren, and we're made in his image and likeness, and we're supposed to be like him. 
Yeah. It's an excuse to do nothing. It's an excuse to say, this is how he made me. I hate this. This is how he made me. You know, no. The, the you you talking about is the old you before you got born again. You, you got made into a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are become new. You can behave different. You can act different. You can talk different. You can walk different. You can, you can walk this life out in purity. Well, everybody else is doing it. Who cares what everybody else is doing? I'm going to tell you something I saw today. He sent it to me, in fact, and it disgusts me. You know, and it's about the Catholic Church, and I, this is the only thing I'm going to say. The Pope says, everybody, 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 everybody can come in. I'm going to tell you something. That, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. If you want to come in, you got to come in through me. You got to let, I'm going to say something else. He had scarlet on. You got to have scarlet on. You got to have the blood of Jesus. He had, he had divinity on. You got to have divinity on. God's divine character has got to come down inside of you and transform you. He had, he had royalty on. You, 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 you can't just keep acting like you in the world. You got to act like you a king's kid. Now, all this, man, I want to hit it one more time. He said, Jesus said, you got it going together on the outside, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. And there's people, they got their, they got their lipstick on right. They got their hair did, did right. They got the best shoes on. They got the best pants on. They got, they got everything looking good and everything where it needs to be. And, and they walk through the church. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Praise the Lord. I'm blessed. And inwardly, they're full of dead men's bones. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many times you say you're blessed. Hmm. What matters is, have you surrendered your life to God? What matters is, have you dealt with what's internal? There, you know, I'm telling you the truth. There's been somebody I said, hey, when did you get saved? They've been sitting in church for like 15, 20 years. I said, when did you get saved? I ain't never got saved. I, what do you mean? I never got saved. I never gave my life to the... I never said the prayer or whatever. Well, man, how many times do we do altar calls and stuff? Yeah, I, I, I don't need that. I know I come to church, so I'm going to go to heaven. No, you ain't finna go to heaven. You know, you can sit in church for a year, two years, three years, 10 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and that don't make you a Christian. I had a Bible instructor say, it's just like if I go sit in a garage, it don't make me no Corvette. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian, just like going to sit in a car in a garage makes you a Porsche. It's what happens down in here that matters. Now, so he deals with all of this. God tells him to make all this. And then, let's go to uh, Exodus 28. Is this helping anybody tonight? Exodus 28, verse 42. And thou shalt make them linen breeches, or linen underwear, to cover their nakedness. From the loins, even unto the thighs, they shall reach. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come unto the tabernacle of congregations, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not their iniquity and die. In other words, if they don't, they can be wearing all this right. And if they don't got their underwear on, they'll die when they come into the holy of holies. Why? Because God is saying it's more importantly what's going on in you, what's going on where people don't see, that I can only see, than what's going on out here in the exterior. In other words, you can be, you can be doing all the serving. You can be, you can be 
you know, helping with, with communion. You could be putting the offering envelopes in the chair. You can be greeting people at the door. You could be helping with the count. You could be worshiping up on stage. You can be doing all this. And you can, you can look like you got it all going on. But if you're not dealing with what I can only see. If you ain't got your underwear on, covering your vulnerability, covering your nakedness, covering your weakness, if you, if you, if you don't care, take care of what's internal, if you don't deal with your character, if you, don't deal, if you don't deal with what's going on on the inside of you and allow me to work in it, if you don't deal with your anger, if you don't deal with your attitude, if you don't deal with your hatred, if you don't deal with your, your lust and your desire for other things, you may look, you may put the picture back up. You may look, you may look like you're doing all the good on the outside, but inwardly you're full of dead men's bones. I came to ask you tonight, do you got your britches on? God wants to deal with what's inside more than he wants to deal with what's outside. Yeah, the outside shows that you're bearing fruit. The outside shows the outside shows that you're doing something for the Lord. People can see. But I want to ask you, no matter what I see, hey, Renee's doing well. Renee's praying. Renee's worshiping. Renee's crying out to God. But inwardly, do you trust? Inwardly, are you crying out to God to change not just your outward circumstance, but change you inwardly to where you don't have the same character flaws you had last year? That got you in the mess that you're in. God's wanting to deal with what's inwardly. Man, he's been on me and on me and on me about this. He's like, I'm telling you, there's things coming. And, and you know what? What you look like on the outside ain't going to carry you through. But what takes place on the inside, it's going to carry you through every storm, every trial, everything the enemy throws at you. Because when you're right in here, it doesn't, it doesn't care what happens out here. Get right in here. He says, I see the way you look, and I see the way you praise, and I see the way you serve, and I see where you're going and doing these extra things, and you're going out and witnessing, and you're going to prisons, and you're going to the nursing home, and you're going to the homeless, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. But do you got your britches on? I'm going to share the story I shared last Sunday night. Kenneth Hagin said there was a woman and a man, and God used the men but didn't use the woman, and the woman's been serving the Lord for years and had all the lingo and all the talk and looked so good, and this man looked rough, and he saw this man going into a place he shouldn't, and he said, God, how come you use him and you didn't use her? And he said, well, he went into the, that place that you're talking about to do something for me. And that woman, she may look like she's a Christian and she may look like she's got it all together. But inwardly, for the last 32 years, she's been in rebellion against me in her heart. And that's what he's talking about when he says, when they come before my presence, make sure they got their underwear on. He told them to put all this on first, but he says, hey, not, don't just have the outer gear. Don't just have, just don't have the fruit, but have the integrity to, yeah, to withstand anything. Have the, yeah, to sustain. Have your underwear on. Now, let's bring it into New Testament terms. You know, we got some New Testament underwear we're supposed to be wearing. Did you know that? Let's go to Colossians, and we're going to wrap it up. Is this helping anybody tonight? That's what the title of this message ought to be, New Testament Underwear. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We're going to really trip people out on the Internet. They're going to see that and be like, what is that? Okay. Let's go to Colossians here. Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 12. I want to say something. So kicking back off with the first scripture, you're a chosen 
generation, a royal priesthood. They were chosen. The priests were chosen from God, from God to be the priest. Aaron and all his descendants were chosen to be priests. They were chosen. We see that we're chosen and we're a royal priesthood. I want to show you something. He's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. He's speaking to God's elect. Well, guess what that word means? God's chosen. He says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. I want you to see this. Bowels of mercy. Do we got it up, Colossians? Put on, therefore, the elect or the chosen of God, holy and beloved. Bowels of mercy. You know what that word bow means? It's internal. It's internal, and listen to what this word means. It's in, internal or inward affection, your inward parts, your heart. So what he's saying is have mercy down on the, the first garment that you're supposed to be wearing as a Christian. Down inside of you is mercy. Mercy is compassion, pity. Coming from the heart. In other words, I'm going to say something. There's churches full of Christians. When they look on people in the world, when they look on sinners, when they look on someone that isn't like them, they look on them with disgust and not with mercy. They ain't got their undergarments on. They ain't walking in mercy. When you see somebody that's in pain, when you see someone that's hurting, when you see someone that's in despair, you're supposed to be walking in mercy. Not like, oh, I'm glad I'm out of that. No. God rescued you so you can rescue somebody else. And the Christian's main garment is mercy. So you can look at them and say, I was once where you are. Okay, I read y'all, I read you about Moses getting instructions on the on the, the, the priestly garments in Exodus 28. I just read that to you. Do you know why? I, I, need, to, I need to share this with you. Do you know why Moses was te- God was telling Moses what outfit to make Aaron, what I just showed you? Aaron was down. While God's giving him instructions on what to make for him to put on, Aaron's down at the bottom of the mountain making a golden calf for everybody to worship. God's saying, I've called him to be my high priest, and I want him to look like this. I want him to act like this. I'm going to sanctify him. And he's down at the bottom of the mountain making a golden calf. And he says, okay, stop with what I'm telling you. you got to go deal with this. And Moses comes down, and he sees them worshiping and having orgies and doing all this stuff around the golden calf. And he, and he ends up... Uh, throwing the tablets down and they break and people die and Aaron's still alive and he's still commissioned to be high priest. And he still has to wear those outer garments and guess what? He still has to put on his underwear. He still has to deal with what's internal. And I said, God, you're commissioning him at the very moment you're commissioning him to, to look like this and to walk in purity and to walk in the Word. He's fashioning a golden calf. Why did you still use him? Why did you still call him? And this is what he told me. And this is when he was teaching me to be a pastor. He said, he said because I knew that he would remember that day. And every time someone came to him with their mess, every time someone came to him jacked up, every time somebody came to him not right with God, he wouldn't stand in judgment over him. He would have mercy and compassion. And I'm telling you something, your inner garment, the thing that should be first in your life is your mercy towards other people. The very first thing David talks about in that list I gave you in 2 Samuel 22 is God shows mercy on those that are merciful. I'm going to tell you something. (sighs) Ain't everybody got it together. Ain't everybody got it right. You might be further along, but you know what? One time you was jacked up. 
One time you was in sin. One time you didn't have it together. One time you was hurting. One, and sometimes we forget what it feels like to hurt. Have mercy. That's got to be your first garment. That's, gotta, that's the Christian's first, first layer is mercy. Let's look at some other ones. Mm. Kindness. Kindness is moral excellence, goodness, gentleness, integrity to others. In other words, with your mercy, you put your mercy on. So when you see someone in the streets, I'm going to say this. You see a homeless person. And he comes up and asks you for help. Oh, you got yourself there. Yeah, and you know what? You got yourself in a big old mess too until Jesus got you out. Have mercy. But then kindness goes a step further. Kindness says, okay, I was where you were at. But let me help you get up out of where you're at. Let me bring you further. Let me, let me, let me, let me have some moral excellence on you. In other words, in other words, no matter what I think of your situation or how you got in that situation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be good to you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you who God is through me. I'm going to show kindness on you. You know, Jesus all the time, he would see people in need, and you know what it said? He was moved with compassion. I love the one where he, he was just wanting to get away. He just found out John uh, died his cousin, and he was wanting to get away for a little while, and he was wanting to go take a break, and all these people saw him get on the boat, and they realized where they were going, so they ran all night around the coast to get to where he was sailing to, and when he got off the boat, they were all standing there, and he didn't send them away. He didn't say, man, I don't want to talk to y'all right now. I don't want to minister to you right now. Don't you know I'm going through something? No. The Bible says when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. And your, your, your second layer is, is kindness, compassion. you got to have it. Never think that you're here and someone else is there. I'm going to tell you, and, th and this is going to mess with some of y'all watching and some of y'all in here maybe, but you know what, where you should think you are to everybody else? You should think you're here and everybody else is here. In other words, you, you, you look at yourself like you're their servant. If Jesus was standing here right now, he wouldn't think he was, he wouldn't act like he was higher than none of y'all. He'd probably be washing all y'all's stank feet. And I'm just being honest. Jesus looked at himself here, and he went and sat with people that, the people that were dressed like that, that I showed you earlier, said, what you doing sitting with them people? What you eating with them people? Don't you know they're a sinner? And he said, don't you know that the, the well don't have no need for a physician? I came, to, I came to mend the sick. I came to mend the hurt. I came to mend the sinful. I came to take care of those that are lost. Your first garment is mercy. Your second garment is is kindness, compassion, goodness, gentleness. Be gentle towards people. Somebody ugly to you? <laughs> I, I'm a Star Trek fan. And there's this old Star Trek movie. It's called The Voyage Home. And Kirk and everybody, and I'm not going to say the cuss words, but Kirk and everybody had to go back in time and they're, they went back in time to the 1980s. And Kirk is walking, and they ain't used to cars. He's walking, and he steps out in the street, and this cab almost hits him. And uh, the cab driver calls him a couple choice words, and he says, well, double blankety-blank on you. He calls, he, he's, okay, you call me that, I'm doubling it back on you. Well, when we're, we're out in the world and somebody somebody's mean to us or somebody says something they, sh they shouldn't say to us or they're hateful to us, we shouldn't put it back on them double. No, we should be gentle towards them. We should be kind. And I'm going to tell you, that's, that one's been hard for me, but I'm getting it. I've gotten it. 
It's not that I'm getting it. I've gotten it. Every once in a while, the devil tries to test me, but I got it. The next one. Y'all getting anything out of this? I know I am. So the next one is humbleness of mind. And I got a definition for it, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to break it down to Nate Dog. Don't think you're better than anybody else. Don't, don't, again, don't put yourself here. In fact, I'm going to read it now. I wanted to give you Nate Dog definition, but I want to show you this. <laughs> Having a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of littleness, Listen to that. A deep sense of littleness. In other words, I ain't nobody without Christ. It's a deep sense of littleness. A deep sense of modesty. Now, the next one is meekness. And that's gentleness, mildness. You walk in humility. And so, you're humble of mind, but you're not just humble of mind and, and, and and have a deep sense of littleness, but then you also walk out that humility. In other words, you're not boastful to people. You're not braggadocious. You're not, you're not look at me and look at what I've done for myself. No. You're like, man, people, like, how'd you get where you're at? To God be the glory. God got me where I'm at. God, God pulled me up out of the miry clay. God changed me. God healed me. God set me free. God delivered me. Always know that you're not there by yourself. You're right where you're at because God. And I'll say something else, because God put people in your life. You know, I'm going to say this. So many times, I, I heard it the other day. Well, I don't, go to, I don't go to church because of hypocrites. Well, I guess you're a hypocrite at the house. That's like going into a gym and seeing fat people and saying, I ain't going to work out. There's fat people there. Well, you're going to a gym to not be fat. I guess I want to go to where they're, they're, they're getting skinny in the gym. Same thing. You're going you're gonna to go into church and you're going to find hurt people. You're going to find flawed people. You're going to find people that ain't got it together. You're going to find some people that got it together. You're going to find some people that are just happy that they're alive and in their right mind. And guess what? You, you ride in the same mix with them. You need people. Well, it's just me and God. That's a, that's a lie. God, God is called... Let's go back to it. He had them put the 12 tribes of Israel on their shoulders. We're supposed to bear one another up. I'm going to show you that in what I'm reading you right now. It says that. I'm going to show it to you in a second. But you know what? You ain't in this by yourself. God uses men to give blessings to you. God uses men to pray. God uses men to instruct and correct. And you know what? If you're sitting there with your, with your holier-than-thou self talking about, man, I'm just sitting at home and it's just me and God. Well, what, did you, what are you doing for God? Because if it's you and God, he's going to give you a mission. He's going to give you a mandate. And you know what that mission and mandate involves? People! Don't ever listen to anybody say, oh, it's just, I'm just at home and it's me and God. Say, you know what? You, you need people. And God calls us to minister to people. Glory. Long suffering. Patience. Consistency. I want to talk about that. Be consistent. Don't be don't be hot. One minute cold the next. Don't be one foot in, one foot out. Be consistent. Have some endurance. Yes, times get hard. Yes, things get tough. But be consistent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray even if I don't feel like it. I'm going to worship even if I don't feel like it. I'm going to give even if I don't have it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout even if my... I don't feel like shouting. Even if everything's coming against me, I'm going to shout. I'm going to praise. I'm going to seek the face of God. I'm going to worship. I'm going to witness. Be consistent. If you start off doing something, don't stop. 
this, I'm going to tell you, when you start off and this stuff comes against you, it's coming against you to get you to stop. And most people stop. And they don't realize the enemy's coming against your endurance. He's coming against your, your consistency. He's coming against your long suffering. But say, you know what? I'm going to do it even if you are coming against me. I'm going to show up even if you do are throwing extra on me. I'm going to show up even if, even if you are uh, trying to make me uh, slow down. I ain't slowing down. I'm going to speed up. I'm going to tell you something. Everything that you can possibly think of, not everything, but a lot. <laughs> I'll say that. A lot has been thrown at me this year. And, I, and one minute I, I asked the God. I, I, asked, I asked the God. I asked God. God, what's going on? And he says, the enemy's trying to test your endurance. He's trying to see at what point he can get you to quit. And he does that. He, he, he moves so he can get you to throw in the towel, to get you to stop, to get you to quit. Like, I'm done. I didn't sign up for this. And I came to tell you tonight, one of the garments that you put on is consistency. You put on, listen to this, you put on mercy. You put on kindness. You put on humbleness of mind. You put on, you put on humility. And you put on consistency. Be consistent. You know what they say? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. That means you're consistently taking some bites. It means you don't give up. And once, at sooner or later, you're going to look and you're going to have an ate-up elephant. Well, there's things in your life that the enemy's throwing at you. Be consistent in the Word, consistent in prayer, consistent in what God has for you to do, and you're going to see victory. I'm about to wrap it up now. Yeah. The Bible says that He's the author and finisher of our faith. He, he refines us. He brings us through. He, he that began a good work in you is able to complete it until the day of Christ. Okay, verse 13. I'm going to need your help, Renee. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. I want to show you what forbearing is. I looked it up in the Greek. Come here. Come stand right there. Kind of open your arms up a little bit. No, turn around and face me. Okay, so kind of lean towards me. Like lean towards me this way. Forbearing means to do this. In other words, when he's about to fall, I bear him up. And it means to lean into each other and press into each other in love. In other words, when he's, when he's weary, I, I, I lift him up in love. Amen. Amen. That's what that word means. That means for us to, to get up underneath each other in love and hold each other up. Did I pick you up off your feet or what? Why did y'all laugh? Okay. I, I, I snapped you back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Forbearing one another in love, forgiving one another, if any have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you also. Verse 14. And above all these, so above mercy, above kindness, above humbleness of mind, above meekness, above long suffering. Put on charity. That word charity is agape, the God kind of love. The, lo the love that does not bear a record. The love, the love that will love you no matter what circumstance or situation you're in. The love that will say, I, I love you and I don't require anything from you. In other words, mercy is our undergarment. And love for us as royal priests, love is our outer garment. Love goes on top of everything else. And listen to it. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. In other words, when you begin to walk in mercy, when you begin to walk in kindness, when you begin to walk 
and, and, and modesty of mind. In other words, you don't think yourself more high as you ought to. When you, when you walk out humility, when you're long-suffering and you put on love, then it begins to mature you. It begins to perfect you. I came to, I came to tell you today, just like Jesus walked up to that fig tree and had to curse it because it was doing some false advertising. Let's not do any false advertising. Let's bear fruit. But the way we bear fruit is dealing with things internally. God will bring up character flaws. Don't bury him. Don't say, oh, I need to hide this. Let him deal with it. Don't be like, well, this is the way I always am. He's, he's, he's exposing things in your flesh. Let him deal with it. Surrender it, huh? Yeah, we're new creatures. So let, let us walk out that newness of life. Let, let, let's, if he exposes something, I'm going to tell you all the time. I'm walking with the Lord, and I get slapped with. And it's not something out here. It's something in my character. And he says, you're walking, and you're getting closer to me. But the closer to me you get, you better, ha- you better have them whitey tighties pulled up tight. You better, you, better, you better deal with this internal. You better have your undergarments on. You better, you better deal with this character flaw right here. And it's okay. I'm going to say something. It's okay to have things exposed in your character. God, when God does it, now if somebody's just pointing something out in you and they're, rah, 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 that, that's one thing. But when, God, when you're walking with the Lord and he brings something up, and he says, I need you to deal with this. He's not asking you to deal with it to put you down. He's asking you to deal with it so you can get closer to him. And we all want to get closer to him, don't we? Man, I'm going to say something. When he told him to put on the outer garments, there wasn't a single stitch of that that he said, if you don't have this on, I'll kill you. Do you remember reading that? But he said, if you don't have your underwear on, when you walk into my holy presence, I'm going to strike you down dead. In other words, you got to cover what no one else sees. You got to deal with what no one else sees. Amen? Your character is so important. Everybody talks about the anointing. I want the anointing. I want the anointing. I want the anointing. I want the anointing. I got to have the anointing. I want the position. I want to preach. I want to do this. I want, the, I want to do that. I need the anointing. But I want to tell you something. The character that God puts in us and we allow him to develop it, it's the framework that holds the anointing. If he just put anointing after anointing on you and just put without measure the anointing on you and you don't have the character in the inside, you'll collapse. But if you allow God, that's why the secret place is important because God says he sees in secret. In other words, he sees you surrendering this and surrendering that and crying out for mercy for this and crying out for mercy for that and giving this to God and surrendering this to God. He, and he sees that and then he rewards you openly with the anointing. You know, there's this, this song that, in, that Kingdom Music does, and I, me and Selah have been listening to it a lot, but uh, it was Brian that says this. He says, he says uh, a man that doesn't pray can't stay. A double-minded man is always up and down. And, he, and then he goes on to say, I want to rap, but I ain't going to. But, and then he goes on to say, then he goes on to say, uh, uh, that, that he's not committed because he's not, he doesn't have a prayer life. And I'm going to tell you something. One of the best ways to deal with internal struggles is getting in the secret place and surrendering them to God. Confessing them before the Father and saying, I give you this. You, you must pray. And, and I, I just, I've been meditating on that because he equated not praying to double-mindedness. In other words, a man that doesn't pray ends up becoming double-minded. 
Because he knows he needs to do this for the Lord, but this is over there. And when you get in the secret place, I'm going to tell you something. When God's nature gets down on the inside of you, it deals with your character. And it changes you. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray this word takes root. And Father, I thank you, Father. Yes, you're concerned with what's going on on the outside. And you're concerned with us bearing fruit. It even says that in John 15. But the way we truly bear fruit is dealing with what's internal. And Lord, right now, if the, you know, David said, search my heart and see if there be any wicked thing in me. In other words, search my motives. Search my, search my intentions. Search, search what motivates me. Search, search my agenda. And see if there's anything that's contrary to your plan. Contrary to what you would have me do. And Lord, right now, just right where we're at, let's just take a time with the Lord. And Lord, search my heart. Expose to me the things that aren't of you. And I lay them down at your feet. I surrender. I surrender, Lord. I surrender that attitude. I surrender that mindset. I surrender that doubt. People may not realize it, but doubt is a sin. I surrender that doubt. I surrender that negativity. I surrender that gossip. I surrender. Ooh, this is this is the Lord. I surrender that jealousy. I surrender it. I give it to you. I don't want it. You can't. You say, cast all our cares, cast all our burdens upon you. For you bore our griefs and you carried our sorrows. Just right there where you're at. You know, he's a, I, I believe he's exposing things right now. He's speaking to you about things right now. Lord, I give it to you. He, he's on jealousy. You don't have to be jealous. Everyone in this room got the same God you got. Got the same Bible you got. Got the same Holy Spirit you got. Got the same blood of Jesus you got. You don't got to be jealous. Most of the time, people that are jealous, they're not putting the work in to do what the other one did. The Bible says rejoice with those that are rejoicing. Cry with those that are crying. You got the same opportunities everyone else has got in this room. It ain't, it ain't about being jealous. It's about studying to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to say this too. This is the Lord. You have not because you ask not. And you have not because you ask amiss. You're asking with the wrong intentions. You're asking with the wrong motives. You're asking with the wrong agenda. Come to me pure. Come to me seeking my agenda, seeking my answers, seeking my will for your life. Man, I feel the Holy Spirit in here. Lord, change our perception. Change the way we look at things. And Lord, help us to walk uprightly before you. Try us and see, Lord. And if there's anything in us that you need to expose, expose it and we'll surrender it to you. In the name of Jesus, bless your people, Lord. Bless your people. Let this word not be taken from them. Let them, let them know it's not about what everybody sees on the outside, but it's about, about what you see on the inside, Lord. That counts first. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I love y'all.